Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Number 10. White Mars There is a base even more remote than the International Space Station. It's located in Antarctica. Scientists consider being here an even bigger challenge than living in space. The European Space Agency sent 13 researchers to the Antarctica Concordia Research Station in 2015. It's the most remote human settlement anywhere on Earth. It's even farther to reach from civilization than the International Space Station. And it takes longer to get there, too. Why was the space agency sending humans to such an isolated place? It was a test to see how future crews will handle the hardships of being off-planet. The trip was not the first ever taken. The crew in 2015 was the 11th to spend almost a full year in the miserable darkness of Antarctica. The winter season started in February and didn't end until September. Most crews stay for almost a full 12 months. Concordia Station is located several hundred miles inland, ages away from the nearest coastal station. Coastal stations are preferred because they can be easily reached by ship. But to get to the Concordia Station, brave researchers have to travel over the inhospitable Antarctic wasteland to the Antarctic Plateau that stands almost 10,000 feet above sea level. It is right in the middle of the biggest desert on the planet. The air is so dry it causes skin irritation and cracked lips. The temperature drops to a staggering minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit during the total darkness of winter. And by the way, remember that darkness lasts four months. The only evacuation window is for a few weeks in the summer. If the crew misses the evacuation, they are stuck there for another year. The reason future astronauts are sent here is that the harsh conditions mimic life in space. For example, the low air pressure and thin oxygen. While the researchers live life in the distant base, their vitals are monitored and their psychological well-being, too. Researchers must record video diaries to show their emotional state. Only those who are truly tough and last through the winter with ease are able to go on future missions into outer space. Do you think you could live at the Antarctica Concordia Research Station for one whole year? Let me know in the comments! Number 9. The Sea People There is a group of people who live in the middle of the ocean. They are called the Bajau nomadic on a whole different level. They are nomads of the sea, living in the ocean off the coasts of the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia. The Bajau make their way through the water like nomadic groups of mermaids and mermen. They are not currently recognized by any official state. They don't have citizenship in any country. That means the Bajau have no real right to live anywhere, but it doesn't matter to them because they live in communities detached from land. Sometimes they take breaks on tiny islands, but mostly they float from place to place. In Southeast Asia, the Bajau are called sea gypsies. They live in marine houses built from scratch. Imagine if you were at the beach and you scraped together all the materials you could find and built something that would float along the shallow water. That is kind of how the Bajau lives. The boats are called Lepa Lepa, and they don't have very much space inside. There is enough room for cooking gear and fishing equipment and about five family members. Family members usually have a single outfit with almost no belongings. They spend all their time fighting against nature just to survive. They eat a lot of fish and they hunt lobster and sea cucumber. Sometimes the Bajau will trade their catch to islanders for other goods, like fresh water. Nobody knows how long the Bajau have been living at sea, long enough that they have learned every trick in the book. They make their own sunscreen based on rice powder. Women use the sunscreen heavily to keep their skin smooth until they are married, hoping their smooth skin will attract a spouse. The largest of their floating houses can hold a community of up to 30 people. It only takes them about three weeks to build. I've been saving the most interesting part for last. The Bajau are considered the best free divers in the world. They have evolved beyond normal human capacity. Living at sea for so long has given them the uncanny ability to stay underwater for up to 13 minutes, probably even more. They barely need to breathe as they dive to depths of up to 200 feet. This allows them to easily collect sea creatures. In another few generations, it wouldn't be that big of a shock to learn that Bajau had developed gills and fins. Number 8. Life in a Lighthouse 
The southernmost landmass on the Australian continental shelf is a place called Matsuiker Island. It's about as remote as you can get in this world. In fact, the island is home to the most isolated job in the world. The island encompasses 186 hectares of land. It's beautiful but barren and a truly harsh place to live. Horrendous winds batter the island relentlessly. It's like living at the edge of a hurricane. It rains 250 days out of the year, with the sky gray and overcast most of the time it's not raining. The rain and the wind mixed is enough to make any normal person never want to visit, let alone live on the island ever. And yet people still volunteer to take on the mantle of lighthouse keeper for six months. It's a coveted job, but when many people don't realize how serious it is. The wind is so strong that sometimes if you try to go outside, you can be knocked flat on your back. Matsuiker Island is part of Southwest National Park. The lighthouse and outbuildings have been on the island since 1891. Caretakers are needed constantly to prevent the harsh weather from destroying everything. Those who volunteer for the most remote job in the world have a big schedule to keep. They have to work as cleaners, electricians, and painters. It's their job to keep the lighthouse running. Sure, they can hang out and watch whales, but they also have to report the weather at specific times each day. They have to cut the grass and cook their meals. It might not be the worst place in the world to live, but it's certainly one of the most challenging, especially since in the case of a disaster or an especially fierce storm, the lighthouse keepers could get washed right off the island. And now for number seven, but first it's shout out time. I want to give a big thank you to Siri Aaron and Chris Vander Schiff for supporting this channel. Thanks guys. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like this and to join the Origins Explained family. Number seven, the nomads of the Sahara. The Sahara Desert is one of the most unimaginable places in the world to live. How could anyone thrive in the brutal sand dunes of North Africa? Well, the truth is that people have been doing it for years. The Tuareg have inhabited the Saharan regions of Niger, Libya, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Algeria for over 2,500 years. Tuareg in Arabic translates to abandoned by God. The Tuareg live in such an unfriendly place that those who encountered them thought they had been banished from the world by God himself. Nobody knows where the Tuareg originally came from. Some say they could be descendants of the ancient Berber people, but it's all very speculative. Ancient Greek historian Herodotus wrote of the Tuareg people in the 5th century BC, suggesting they go back even before then. Currently, nobody knows how many desert nomads are wandering the Sahara. Experts have estimated anywhere between 300,000 and 1 million. Up until the middle of the 20th century, Tuareg camel caravans were pivotal in bringing goods across the Sahara. As masters of the desert, they became wealthy by trafficking goods from one city to another. But because they had limited space, they focused primarily on luxury items. Their wealth dwindled though when Europeans began to construct railways and roads. There was no more need for the people of the dunes. So what do the Tuareg keep busy with these days? They keep busy fighting against the government for their share of uranium deposits in Niger on their ancestral land. They live in simple nomadic huts made of weaved mats and timber. They dance, they practice some degree of Islam for the most part, and the Tuareg continue to survive in one of the harshest environments on the planet, a modern mystery to most as they move unseen through the desert. Number 6. The Sherpas of the Mountain Long before Europeans took an interest in climbing Mount Everest, the Sherpa people of Nepal lived high in the Himalaya mountains. The term Sherpa means people from the east. It's a reference to the Sherpa's origins in eastern Tibet. They began as nomadic people in the ancient past, likely a thousand years ago or more. Then, in the 15th century, Sherpas began migrating into Nepal. They worked as traders and herders. They farmed and took care of livestock. Then they began trickling into the higher altitudes of the Himalayas. Since they originated in Tibet, Sherpas today are largely Buddhist. The Rangpu Monastery is one of the highest religious structures in the world. It's located at 16,000 feet above sea level on the north side of Mount Everest. The Sherpas lived such a dangerous existence in the mountains that much like the Bajau, their bodies began to adapt. Sherpas have an increased number of red cells in their blood compared to ordinary people. This allows them to carry more oxygen, 
which really helps when living in a place without much oxygen. Take Babu Chiri, for example. He is famous for having stayed at the summit of Mount Everest for 21 hours without auxiliary oxygen. He also went down in history for climbing the mountain the fastest out of anyone. He did it in 16 hours and 56 minutes. Sadly, he passed away in 2001 during his 11th ascent to the top. Generations of living in the mountains helped Sherpas learn how to protect themselves from freezing temperatures and avalanches. When Europeans started to climb Mount Everest, Sherpas were the local people who helped them reach the top. The relationship has been maintained through all these years. But not many people realize that Sherpas are their own community of people, used to living in the icy lands of the Himalayas. Number 5. The Orinoco River People There is an ancient group of people who live deep in the Venezuelan jungle. They are the people of the Orinoco River Delta. You can call them the Warao. In a world of wild monkeys and flying toucans, the Warao live a simple existence in a truly grueling part of the jungle. River dolphins swim by as they bathe, blue and red macaws sing from the trees. For an outsider, it seems absolutely romantic. It's like going back to the dawn of time and living before industrialization. But life for the Warao is not as peaceful as it may seem. There are roughly 30,000 Warao people living throughout the jungles of South America, but the main bulk live in Venezuela along the Orinoco. The Orinoco is the third largest river in all of South America. Because so much of their life revolves around the river, the Warao are excellent canoe builders. They use their canoes to move swiftly from place to place. Legend has it their children learn to paddle before they learn how to walk. The Warao live in modest thatched huts built on stilts. They have to deal with constant flooding from the river, so their houses need to be versatile. Several families will share a hut together. They spend much of their time weaving and gathering leaves, they fish, hunt, and collect fruit, but they also live partly in the modern world. Their kids go to school, and generators bring moderate amounts of electricity. Their peaceful existence came to a grinding halt in the 1960s when outside influences started affecting their river. The Orinoco suddenly became full of salt, and all the fish started dying. They couldn't support themselves any longer because they didn't have enough food. Then, as civilization encroached, they started getting sick. The oil and mining industry didn't help by poisoning their river. Many Warao started to get diseases. They still live along the river today, but modern society has not been kind to the Warao. Number 4. Itokor Tor Meat One of the most remote settlements on Earth is a place you might have a difficult time pronouncing. Itokor Tor Meat The city is so isolated that people call it the edge of the world. It's home to only 450 people in northeast Greenland. It's at the border of the largest national park in existence. Because of its location, Itokortor meat isn't the easiest place to live. It's frozen solid for nine months out of the year. The tiny outpost is made from quaint wooden buildings painted in bright colors. The houses are set up along a coastal bluff, truly looking like the final outpost on an alien planet. The settlement was founded in 1925 by Danish explorer Einar Mikkelsen and 80 Inuit people. The Inuit settlers were taken from Tassilak in western Greenland. Colonial Denmark was worried about the growing issues that were happening in Tassilak, where the native Inuit were experiencing difficulties in their survival. It was also a way for Denmark to colonize Greenland and officially make it part of their own kingdom. The move was great for the settlers who had sudden access to hunting foxes, walruses, narwhals, and seals. Prior to the founding of Itokor Tormit, other Inuit had lived in the area. Archaeologists have found the ruins of much older settlements though their history is lost. These days, locals don't hunt as many polar bears as they used to. The world is changing, and much of the town relies on tourism of all things. Though to be honest, tourism has a narrow window. People can only arrive by boat for a couple of months out of the year. If you're lucky, you might catch a ride with a helicopter going in that direction. Would you like to visit this place, or have you already? Let me know in the comments! Number 3. The Simulator it's one thing to send volunteers to the depths of Antarctica, but now scientists are being locked in a gigantic Martian simulator. In 2023, NASA locked volunteers inside a simulated Martian habitat. It was part of the space agency's CHAPIA mission to see how humans survive in complete isolation. The participants are not astronauts. The group includes people like research scientist Kelly Haston and emergency physician Nathan Jones. 
This is the very first time that NASA has created a full simulation to gauge the human response to a long-duration mission to Mars. As you're watching this video, the participants most likely are experiencing what life will really be like in one of the first Martian settlements. This experiment is the real deal. This simulator includes a private crew quarters, there's a kitchen and a medical bay, they have a recreation facility for fitness, and a small indoor farm for growing food. All of this is stuffed in a small space of only 1,700 square feet. Scientists must be able to tackle any problems that arise, anything from equipment failure to simulated spacewalks. The Mars habitat is a 3D printed structure. The four people placed inside the building are strangers. They will deal with limited resources and environmental stress. For an amazing 378 days, the crew will live together, hopefully in harmony. NASA says the information will help them make better decisions and design a successful human mission to the Red Planet. It's not just about living in space anymore, it's about colonizing another planet. This is the first step. What do you think will happen to those four people over the next year? Let me know in the comments below and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. Number 2. The Reindeer Herders of Mongolia Mongolia is one of the most sparsely populated countries in the world. Until very recently, Mongolians still lived the same nomadic lifestyle as people did when Genghis Khan was their great ruler, but in modern times, people began flocking to the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. Now the majority of Mongolians live in their capital. The rest of their country is wide open and mostly empty. In the isolated corner of northern Mongolia, right at the border of Siberia, there are people who still live as if it's still the 13th century. They are called the Duka people. They migrate from one place to another in search of resources so that they may continue their existence. They live the old way of life, herding reindeer across the vast taiga. The Duka are also called the Satans. They've been living in the deep forests of Mongolia for thousands of years. Once every 7 to 10 weeks, the community packs up all their belongings and moves with their reindeer to a new place. They are one of the very few remaining tribes of their kind. What's really amazing is that they depend on the reindeer to continue their archaic way of life. They wake up in the morning and milk the reindeer, they eat the reindeer, they ride the reindeer. The reindeer are really the central pillar of the Duka's lifestyle. They couldn't exist without them. Hamid Sardar Afkami is an anthropologist from Harvard. He spent several years living with the Duka and documenting their history. According to him, there were once 200 families spread out through the remote Mongolian north. Now, there are only about 40, left with as few as 1,000 reindeer. Hamid said that most of the families have given up on the harsh conditions of the taiga and moved to the city. The biggest problem is the defection of the youth. Youngsters want to go in a warm cabin, learn how to drive a car, and experience life. The mass defection of the younger Duka has led to a rapid decline in the population of the nomads. There are still a handful of them left, enjoying one of the greatest landscapes in the world without pollution or traffic, but they might not be around forever. As more and more Duka leave for the city, life for the reindeer herders becomes even more difficult. Number 1. Hell on Earth the Danakil Depression in Ethiopia is one of the most volatile landscapes of our planet. It is a horrendous mixture of sulfur fields, volcanoes, and salt flats. The average temperature is around 93 degrees Fahrenheit. However, it's not unusual that the temperature can soar to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Although, I'm not so sure it's a big deal now because this year Las Vegas alone was 117 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's not that far off. I think in summer 2023, a lot of places have been hell on Earth. The most important part of the depression, which sits at an astounding 300 feet below sea level, is the salt mines. Located in Lake Afar, these salt mines stretch for tens of thousands of square miles. For generations, miners have been extracting the salt from this brutal place and bringing it across the desert in camel caravans. It's been going on for a long time and is still happening today. An estimated 1.3 million tons of salt every year is taken from the mines. Workers wearing little more than beige rags break plates of salt from the crust of the earth. Then they chop them into rectangles and lash them to their camels or donkeys. The journey from the mines to the commercial town of Berahail is about 50 miles through unbelievable heat. It takes about three days, and often the workers toil with little water and almost no food. Yet they walk through a part of the planet most people wouldn't last more than two hours in before they passed out from heat stroke. How much do you think an Ethiopian worker makes for transporting salt tiles 50 miles across the most brutal desert on the planet? 
A salt miner makes an average of one burr per tile, which is about five cents. They cut around 200 tiles in a day, earning them $10, so they make around $100 a month. In 2015, National Geographic reported an incident in which an earthquake broke open the ground here. Camels and goats were swallowed by a sudden hole in the earth. This is a truly nightmarish place. The Afar people have been doing it for untold generations and show no sign of stopping. Even when big companies have tried to muscle in on their salt, they've always forced the companies to pack up and leave. The Afar are fiercely protective over their salt plains. Thanks for watching! Which of these incredible landscapes do you think would be the worst to survive in? Let me know in the comments below! And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already! See you next time! Bye!